What's up, y'all? Great to see you this morning. Welcome to Southland. We're so happy to see you today. We're excited to worship with you this morning. If you're new around here, thanks so much for joining us today. We're so excited that you're here. We're going to sing some songs of praise to Jesus, so let's stand up and thank Him for all the good things that He does for us. For every battle you've won without question, for every lie that you've silenced with love, we acknowledge you in every victory, Almighty God. For every promise you kept in the valley, for every burden you lifted with ease, we are gathered with great expectation, Lord, we Sing it out.
upon his shoulders Who endured the cross and scorned its shame Who was laid to rest like every other But who rose again that song says it all. We trust in God's authority. We know his word is true. And that's what the song's about. So we're going to lift this up to him this morning. Let's sing this out. Creation knows the voice that spoke into the void. The breath that brought the dust to life And sang the stars to fall The darkness fears your voice That drove it back before And though the night is long We'll drive it back once more. One word. One word from you. Things change on your authority. 
Well, hey, y'all, we're glad you're here. Thanks for coming to worship with us. I want to invite you to take just a second, say hey to some people around you, and you can grab a seat. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Greg, and I serve as part of the ministry team here at Southland. Did everybody get to see the beautiful sunset last night? Did you see that? Spectacular. And then a bonus this morning. I was rolling in at about 6.30, and I uh, got to see a sunrise. It was just a spectacular. You know, it's good to be here today. Good to be with you. I had a conversation earlier this week with a gentleman who's actually been a part of Southland for quite a few years. And long before we started using the imagery of a triangle, that's doing life with Jesus in community and on mission, this guy knew that the best way to connect with Jesus and to stay on mission is to do that alongside other people. So he's been a part of Southland groups over the years and currently serves uh, with our community garden. But he was calling me to say that the recent passing of his beloved wife means some things are going to change. But he said one thing that's not going to change is his desire to stay connected. So we're working right now to find a group for him. He might even end up starting his own group. Last week we mentioned that now is a great time for you to check out Southland Groups. It's not too late for you to jump into a Bible study or a serve group or an activities-based group. I'm going to be in the concourse afterwards at the help desk. I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have about groups or you can go to southland.church slash groups, access the directory there for our campus, and then all you have to do is click on a group that you're interested in, and you'll be notified about how to jump in. So if we can help you take that step, let us know. Well, you've seen the videos and images on the screens prior to our services. They're generally uh, images of ministry activities that take place here at Southland. A few weeks ago, a bunch of students were here early, good for them, uh, to attend a service, and they all happened to attend the same school in Fayette County, and they thought they noticed their teacher on one of the images, and they couldn't wait to get to school the next day to ask her about it. And sure enough, it was her. She was serving at Jesus Prom, and they saw her. And this teacher later told us uh, that she has decided as a result of that uh, to start serving in our student ministries. But that whole interaction gave her an opportunity to have a conversation with those students that she may not have normally been able to have. There's so many great things happening in our student ministries right now. It's a great time to check it out. In fact, there's an important night coming up on Wednesday, May 1st at 7 o'clock. It's called Preview Night. And we're inviting all of our existing fifth graders and their parents to attend a middle school program that night down in Building F. And then that same night, all of our eighth graders are going to make their way up to the concourse to Building B to experience high school for the first time. So we know this is an exciting time. It can raise a lot of questions. We want to answer those questions. Head out to the help desk afterwards, or you can go to southland.church slash Nicholasville, and all the information that I just gave you will be right there. Let us know how we can help. Well, we're continuing our teaching series uh, that we've been in called Counterfeit. And so hopefully you brought your Bible, uh, something to take notes on. Scott Nickel is on his way out right now to teach us. Let's go ahead and join in uh, with our other campuses for Scott's message today. We're glad you're here. What's up, y'all? How are we? I think we should begin today by expressing our collective appreciation for Lydia, who preached last week and did a phenomenal job. 
Not only did she serve our church really well and preach a great sermon, but she spared you all the pain of having to hear me preach on womanhood. So for that, we can all be grateful. Now listen, I was all ready. I was queued up. I was ready to sing some Shania Twain and everything. So I guess I'll just have to file that away for another Sunday. The truth of the matter is preaching ain't easy. And when I was in Bible college, I had to take a preaching class, which is super awkward, super weird, much like a speech class. You have to like practice sermons in front of people, and that just feels so disingenuous and manufactured and kind of fake and performative and things like that, but you just kind of have to do it because preaching is like any discipline. You have to be really bad at it before you can ever be any good at it, and so you have to fail a lot before you ever succeed. But one of the, one of the assignments that we had in this preaching class, and I loved my professor, he, he told us we all had to actually go preach at a church. We had to find a church that would take us to preach. And I had a problem with that because I was already employed here at Southland. So I was, I was a part-time uh, staff member here every weekend. I was down here working. And so there wasn't, first of all, we had a great preacher. His name was Mike Bro, And I was pretty certain he wasn't going to hand over the preaching responsibilities to a 19-year-old part-time staff member who was still in Bible college. And so I went back to my professor and said, man, what am I supposed to do? Because I'm busy on Sunday mornings when everybody else is going to be out preaching at these churches. He said, oh, don't worry about it. I will find you a church in the Cincinnati area where you can preach on Sunday evening when you get back into town. So I said, oh, that's, that's great. And so as it turned out, when he said Cincinnati area, that meant somewhere within the boundaries of the state of Ohio because this was way before like navigation systems and things like that. I grabbed one of my friends and roommates, his name was Dan, and we journeyed into the middle of nowhere, Ohio, found this old church building and went up and sat on the front steps because it was all locked up and we just waited for the Sunday night service crowd to gather. Finally, the preacher showed up and he walked up and said, oh, you're the one they sent from the Bible college to preach. I'm like, yeah, that's me. And he says, he says I said to him, I said, hey, when does the service start? And he said, well, the choir will roll in here in the next few minutes. You'll preach to them and then they'll rehearse. And I started to laugh and he didn't seem to understand why I thought that was funny. And so he goes, what's so funny? And I said, so are you saying I'm literally preaching to the choir? And he's said, yeah, and it still didn't get the joke. I was like, all right, man. So I just took one for the collective team, preached my sermon to the choir, and got out of Dodge. It can be pretty hard to measure success in preaching, especially when you're preaching to the choir. I think we're pretty clear, though, on how our world measures success, aren't we? Our world, our culture measures success through the primary ways that have been around for a long time of you know, money and education, influence, power, pleasure, all those kinds of things. But the question I really want to ask today is have you ever stopped to wonder how does God measure success? Like what does he mean when he says this is what a successful life looks like? And today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a man who literally took every possible path. He walked down every trail and even blazed some unprecedented trails to becoming successful. His name probably heard of him before, was Solomon. His father, David, was a famous warrior king who had to fight for everything. His exploits were many, from slaying giants to defeating armies and establishing his kingdom. But Solomon, his son, was altogether different. He inherited something he didn't have to fight for, his wealth that he didn't have to work for, and his power that he didn't earn. He was born into a very privileged position, yet even with all of the inherited wealth and fame, he was unsatisfied throughout his life. He longed for more than what he had, and he spent his entire life trying to fill that void. And at the end of his life, he wrote it all down for us. And that book is found in our Bibles. It's called the book of Ecclesiastes. And in chapter, chapter three, he says this about our creator God. He says, he has put eternity into man's heart. You ever sat down and tried to fathom, comprehend eternity? I have. It's actually a terrifying thing to do, and some of you have done that as well. It can mess with your mind. It can mess with your heart. We don't have any idea what it would be like to exist outside of time. It's like a fish trying to understand what it would be be like to exist outside of water. It just takes our breath away. Yet, there's something deep inside of us that longs for something this world can't seem to give us. And the question behind that is why? Why is that? Well, C.S. Lewis spent his entire life writing about that very 
tension, he famously said this, most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. In other words, all the things that we typically fixate on, things like like power and money, all these things that we seek to gain to fulfill us, they just never quite scratch the itch. And then he, here's the real famous part. He said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is I was made for another world. And if only Solomon could have read C.S. Lewis, it would have saved him a lot of sorrow. Because you see, at a very young age, Solomon decided to run this experiment on himself. He recognized this deep longing, this stirring within his soul. And like C.S. Lewis, he set out to satisfy it. But the problem for Solomon was he had the most resources to put behind that experiment that anyone had ever had or would ever have. It's very diff- difficult for us to quantify the amount of prosperity, prosperity that Solomon had. I mean, financially, he's like, he was like the combination of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and some Middle Eastern prince all combined. He had the influence and power of a U.S. president and a prime minister and a king. He had the intelligence level of the world's greatest scientists. He had the wherewithal of the best engineers. He was literally a mental giant, and he had an unbelievable capacity to fulfill his curiosity. He was eager to learn, and he could apply it any way that he wanted to. And so with all of that at his disposal, he set out on a journey to satisfy his soul. And thankfully for us, he wrote it all down, even though it turned out tragically for him. And his journey began with learning. He says this, I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. Basically, here's what he did. He went to college. Now, here's the thing that distinguished him from many of us, not all of us, but he not only went to college, but he paid attention. Okay? He, he not only bought the books, but he, check this out, read the books. He didn't just take the class. He actually aced all the classes. He learned all the material. He accumulated as much knowledge as was humanly possible. There, if there was a wise man on the face of the earth, Solomon could summon him to learn from him. If there was a philosophy that was gaining popularity, Solomon consulted with the philosopher. This, if there was a theory to be tested, Solomon was in the lab testing the theory. He loved To learn and learn he did. Check this out. God gave Solomon very great wisdom and understanding and knowledge as vast as the sands of the seashore. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men of the east and the wise men of Egypt. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed some 3,000 proverbs. He wrote 1,005 songs. He could speak with authority about all kinds of plants from the great cedar of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows from the cracks in a wall. He could also speak about animals and birds and small creatures and fish. And kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. In other words, he ran down the path of higher education further than anyone had ever run down it. And then one day at the end of that trail from way off in the distance, this was his conclusion that he shouts back to the rest of us, for with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. (laughs) In fact, he, he called it this. He said, it's a chasing after the wind. It's a phrase you'll see repeated all throughout Solomon's writings. And how can that be? How could someone so accomplished be so depressed? How can someone with such capacity feel so empty? How can someone so full of knowledge be at the same time so full of grief? Now, I don't know if you've ever walked the hallowed halls of higher education, and Lord knows I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I can tell you this, they're not exactly bastions of joy. Often, instead, many of you know this, they are a lethal combination of cynicism and arrogance. And being miserable is not a rarity among the educated elite. I've known a lot of exceptionally intelligent people in my life, and those who've tried to satisfy their soul through learning always end up miserable. There's nothing wrong with learning. It's a very, very good thing. There's nothing wrong with earning degrees. That's all good. But by itself, it can never satisfy you. 
I've told you guys many times about my grandfather on my mom's side of the family. Uh, this is a list of the degrees that he got in his lifetime. Look at this. That's a lot. <laughs> That's way more degrees than I got and very complicated things. He was brilliant. He was the smartest person I've ever met. He was brilliant with science. He was brilliant in the military. He retired a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. He was brilliant with languages. I don't even know how many he spoke. It was a lot of them. He was not just good, but he was exceptional at everything that he put his hand to. He loved to make things. He loved to build things. He loved to fix things. I got to, I got to live with him for a couple of years when I was a kid, and he made me go to this thing at his church. It was like the Christian equivalent of the Boy Scouts, and to be super honest with you, it was not my jam at all, uh, but one one very cool day, they gave us all a block of wood. Some of you have done this before. They gave us a block of wood and two sets of wheels on, on axles and said, take this home for about two weeks and you build a race car out of it, bring it back and we'll race it and whoever wins gets a prize. And so I was like, all right, I'm in for that. And I took it home to Papa, and Papa was like, give me that thing, we're in. And, he, and I didn't see it again until I got to sand it down at the very end. And so here's what he did. He literally made a finely tuned Corvette and weighted it perfectly. I mean, he put this thing to the test. It was beautiful, and it not only looked good, but it raced good because we won the whole thing, and he was absolutely <laughs> thrilled. It was always the simple things like that that brought my papa such happiness. Uh, one of my favorite things to watch him do was he would uh, go to the refrigerator, he would open it up, he would get two pieces of bread, and he would take all the contents of the refrigerator and put it between those two pieces of bread and call it a sandwich. Uh, we would go fishing, and we would hop in his truck, and he had all these cassette tapes in there, and he would, he would go, you want to listen to highbrow music? That meant classical music, or lowbrow music, and that meant Johnny Cash. And so we would pick, and then we would go fishing, and either on the way to fishing or on the way home from fishing, he always loved to stop and grab a Dr. Pepper and a candy bar and consume both before my granny could catch him. That was... <laughs> now, here's my question. Why did someone who was so accomplished and have so many degrees not find his happiness in either one of those things. Not find his joy in either one of those things. And the answer is this, because learning was never intended to satisfy your soul, and it never will. Learning is a good thing, but we always have to remember when a good thing becomes an ultimate thing, it becomes what? A destructive thing. Whereas Solomon said, that's just chasing after the wind. And unfortunately for Solomon, he used the privilege of his financial prosperity to pick another path and run the experiment yet again, thinking, all right, if it wasn't learning, perhaps it's something else. And this time he tries pleasure. Look at this. I said to myself, come now, I'll test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Here's what that means. Solomon literally partied like a rock star. In every sense of the phrase. In fact, we actually have long lists recorded in the Bible for us of the resources it took to sustain his parties. Look at this. The daily food requirements for Solomon's palace were 150 bushels of choice flour, 300 bushels of meal, also 10 oxen. This is when all the carnivore diet people get excited. 10 oxen from the fattening pens, 20 pasture-fed cattle, 100 sheep or goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roe deer, and choice poultry. Bro, you think you throw a good backyard barbecue when you throw a brisket on the smoker? This dude could wake up every morning and go, what do I want to eat today? He had 20 pasture-fed cattle on on the smoker every morning. Can you imagine how good that must have smelled? He had all the resources behind him to pull this off. And that was, not, that was just scratching the surface. When he threw a party, he could go, do I want to have a comedian? He could call Dave Chappelle. Do I want to have a rock band perform? He could call the Rolling Stones and they would come play. He had all of that behind him. He could do whatever he want whenever he wanted. He said, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. He built custom mansions. He planted beautiful gardens. He had swimming pools. He was friends with movie stars. He had people waiting on him hand and foot. If he wanted it, he could have it up to and including any woman on the planet. He had a harem of them, all reserved for his sexual satisfaction. He had wives, he had concubines, he had the real life 
physical equivalent of what the internet falsely promises to deliver, which is an infinite number of sexual partners. He went further down the road of pleasure and experiences than any of us ever have or ever could. And at the end of that experiment, this is what he concluded. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Again, he uses the phrase, chasing after the wind. You can never grab a hold of it. It never satisfies. In the moment, I'm sure he had plenty of fun, but it always ran out. It always ran dry. God gave you and I the capacity to experience pleasure, but that gift was never intended to become an ultimate thing in our lives. I was 16 years old in 1996, and I vividly remember gathering with a big group of my closest friends in the basement of one of our friends' houses and watching the Kentucky Wildcats win the national championship game over Syracuse. And it was awesome to experience that for the first time because I'd grown up hearing the stories that my dad would tell of all the championships of the past, but this was the first one that I got to experience. And so the next morning, uh, before I went to class at Dunbar, I drove, many of you remember these days, I drove to Daw Hairs. And I waited in line at Daw Hairs because they had been printing national championship t-shirts all night long. And I was late to class because I had to get my national championship t-shirt and proudly wear it to school that day. And I was in Rupp Arena when the team came back and they drove the bus in. We didn't know they were going to do that. And they all hopped off and Mark Pope was holding the trophy in the whole nine yards. It was it was so, so cool. And so, so, so what I did is I, I got my national championship T-shirt that year, and I made a commitment to myself. I'm going to keep this national championship T-shirt till we get another one. And so in 97, almost got another one, an overtime away from getting another one. 98, got another one. Like, this is life. This is the way it's supposed to be. But then I had to wait a while. This is my national championship T-shirt from 2012. And I was living in Colorado at the time, and I preached on that following Sunday wearing this t-shirt when it still had sleeves before it became relegated to the bin of being a workout t-shirt and a mowing t-shirt. And you know, sometimes you'll get a t-shirt that even after washing it, like it still smells real bad. That's where we're at with this one, right? Now, I'm on team, would love another one. I'm on team time for nine, like let's go, let's get it next year. I'm, I'm, I'm with you in that. But let me tell you something I learned in the early 2000s when I was out in Colorado. The Cats would lose a game and I'd be miserable the next day. And because I'm not good at hiding my emotions, like I don't play poker for that reason, you know. I, people would be like, what's your problem? I'd be like, man, the Cats lost last night. And they're like, the what? <laughs> so we're in Colorado and I'm like, oh, you pagan people, you don't know anything. And... <laughs> I would try to point out to them that they would do the same thing on like a Monday or a Tuesday when the Denver Broncos lost, but they didn't see the correlation at all. It was super frustrating. But then I started to wrestle with this, and I still do, but I started to have to come to the conclusion of like, okay, if, if my mood, my temperament, and the way that I treat people is dictated by a basketball game played by a bunch of 19-year-old young men the night before, I'm the one who needs to grow up. Right? So awkward in here right now. <laughs> but here's the deal. Like, for those of us who are followers of Jesus and being a part of Big Blue Nation is like further down the list, and y'all, it's further down the list. We have this really unique opportunity in front of us right now to apply the teaching. When a good thing becomes an ultimate thing, it becomes a destructive thing. And UK basketball is a good thing. I'm on team, UK is a good thing. So let's cheer on the cats and let's sleep really well at night no matter what happens because temporary things can never satisfy eternal desires. And that applies to so much. And if we don't learn this and orient our hearts correctly, the outcome will always be misery. Look at the way it turned out for Solomon. He says this, So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. How depressing. And if you're waiting for like the nice redemptive bow at the end of Solomon's story, you're going to be waiting a long time because there isn't one. Look at the way his story ends. He had 700 wives of royal birth, 
300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. He, he followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David his father had done. Try to picture this. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives who burned incense and offered sacrifices to their god. Here's what we got to understand. This is hard for us to get. Those false gods, those idols that he built altars to, the worship of those false gods revolved around two things, sexual perversion and child sacrifice much like what we see going on among us today. And the question becomes, how? Like, how did that happen? How did a dude who literally heard audibly from the living God turn that way? How did, how did this man who was given the privilege and the honor of actually assembling and building the temple as a symbol of God's peace and blessing being bestowed upon his people, how did he turn? How did so much privilege and wisdom end up leading to a place where his, his life could literally only be described in one word, and that word is unfaithful. How? Because for us, the only measure of success as followers of Jesus is to be faithful. Faithful. And it's worth noting that Solomon's unfaithfulness in his marriage fueled his unfaithfulness to his God. And I've seen that play out so many times. We live in a culture that measures success by excess, which is a fool's errand. Never works. More is not always better. Certainly true in marriage, one is more than enough. So be faithful to the one that you're married to. And when it comes to worship, the same is true. When your heart is fixed on the one true God, you don't need to turn your heart to other false gods. You see, the battle of our life is sometimes against blatantly and obviously sinful things, but oftentimes it's against something else that's far more subtle and can absolutely blindside us. When we try to get from good things what we can only get from God, we end up destroying those good gifts and making ourselves and everyone around us miserable in the process. When you try to find your joy from what your child does on a playing field, you'll make yourself miserable, you make them miserable, and you'll destroy the beauty of being able to play a game. When you try to find your value and your worth in a paycheck, you're going to end up empty and angry. When you attempt to fill your life with one pleasure after another, you're going to end up alone and, check check this out, numb. When you settle for cheap slogans of health and wealth and prosperity as being sure signs of God's love and blessing, you're going to end up bitter and cynical or just fake. So here's a better path, according to someone who walked down all the wrong ones. He simply said this, stand in awe of God. Stand in awe of God. One of my favorite authors, a pastor named Paul Tripp, wrote a book simply called Awe. I've told you about it before, and one of the things he says in it is this. You could argue that one of the fundamental purposes of the great redemptive story and the person and work of Jesus is to recapture our hearts for the awe of God and God alone. Let me give you a snapshot, just a couple of them, how that looks in my life. Really grateful that after I got done preaching on Easter Sunday, I got to go grab my two youngest sons and hop on a plane and fly down to Florida to watch my oldest son and join my wife and My oldest was playing baseball down there, but we got plenty of beach time in as well. You guys know how much I love the ocean. I took this picture uh, the first morning at sunrise. I was just standing there watching the sun come up, and I just love to be able to stand, and, and I'm overwhelmed when I see just how vast the ocean is, how powerful the ocean is, how strong and seemingly endless the ocean is, but, but I'm in awe of our God who created that. It's overwhelming to me. And when I stand there looking out at those waves, I'm reminded of what Solomon said. God is in heaven. You're here on earth. 
So let your words be few. And I don't think that's because God doesn't want to hear from us. I think that's because we need to hear from him. What do you think? One of the things I think we could celebrate around here is the little glimpses we get of what heaven's going to look like. We had 23,000 people here on Easter. Man, if you don't like big crowds, you're going to hate heaven. And that's our goal around here. We just want to make heaven more crowded. And we had a 174 people get baptized on Easter. How cool is that? And I'm grateful. I'm grateful for you all because you guys have decided. You've said, listen, as a church, there are a lot of churches do a lot of things, but as far as we're concerned at this church, we are going to aim on joining Jesus and his mission to reach lost and broken people. That's why we're here. That's what we're about. And so that's what we get to see every week. It's amazing. But I stand in awe of Jesus who's accomplished so much for us, who did so much for us so that we could have the ultimate and eternal desires of our heart finally satisfied in him and only him. So as we wrap up today, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to read three, I think, really powerful and poignant scriptures. I'm going to ask that we all stand while we read the word of God. Ephesians 1, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Colossians 1, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supreme. Supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Hebrews 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Let's pray. Father God, you hold us together. You hold all things together. In our worst moment, you hold us together. In our best moment, You hold us together and everything in between. Father, we're here today to celebrate who you are and honor you for what you've done. And so, Father, we're here and we simply stand in awe of you. In Jesus' name, amen. stand in all of you yes I stand in all of you and I let my words be few Jesus I am so in love with you. You are God in heaven, and here in my honor. So Jesus
you guys go ahead and grab a seat. We're going to move into a time of communion right now, which is just us taking a moment to celebrate what Jesus did at the cross and acknowledge the fact that he went to the cross so that you and I could live freely. And so we take communion every week to thank him for the sacrifice that he made. If you've accepted Jesus this morning as your Savior, I want to invite you to take communion over the next couple of minutes. But if you haven't, or this is new to you, or Southland is new to you, that's okay. We're going to have some scriptures on the screen as well. That's just going to help guide you through the next couple of minutes and explain what Jesus did for you and for me. There's also a number you're going to see on that screen. We would love to pray for you today. So if there's something going on in your life that you need prayer for, you can text prayer requests into that number. If you want to talk to somebody about who Jesus is, or you have questions about next steps, you can text those into that number as well. And our prayer team will be taking those in and praying for those and reaching back out to you. They're also going to be down front at the end of the service today. So if you'd rather pray with someone in person or talk to them, they'll be down here. And again, they'd love to pray for you. So please let us do that if there's anything going on. In just a second, I'm going to invite you to stand back up and sing with us. But take just a minute right now and thank God for what he did for us. seen and worship with us.
y'all our prayer team is down front they really would love to receive you this morning if there's anything you need prayer for otherwise have an awesome sunday we'll see you back here next week
To wake me up from waiting Do I mean it when I'm praying Just to pray to see you move the mountain somehow I don't want another way to move Among the mirrors I'm protecting And I'm never really claiming All the grace it takes to make a way with you Well, I'm giving in I'm giving in Standing in the river of my second guesses don't believe it when I'm praying, too afraid to pray and stir the water somehow. Never really been okay to move among the whispers, never resting. Is there any other way to make the space it takes to break away with you now? I'm giving in. I'm giving in. I'm ready to back down. The moss bed that cradled my head beneath the dancing trees and sunlight. My secret hideout, my little kingdom, where all the world was beautiful and warm. Living in my memories, Majesty, imagine what I see. 
Unless you pick me up and hold me Hallelujah, hallelujah For the moments with you I'm settling in right into the darkness through an empty open door can't put back what's been broken can't change the moment we went too far we're pulling 